recording is in progress. So um, we will be recording this for just future reference and for accessibility purposes and for um, folks who couldn't join us tonight. Or if you were a little late, don't worry about it. You can re revisit the slides and the recording later. Um, just a few housekeeping items for our Zoom webinar tonight. Um, this is a webinar, so unlike some of the Zoom meetings you might be used to, um, your camera and your microphone are off, but we love to interact with you. So you can put your um, comments and kind of just running, you know, uh, yeah, running commentary. People like to share resources, add little personal um, contexts and stories in the <laughs> chat. Historically, we've had a really sweet uh, chat box interaction. And then there's a separate Q&A um, box uh, on the other side. And so that's where you can keep questions. Um, that's where you can enter questions that you really want the panelists to address during our Q&A question. Or, I'm sorry, our Q&A um, portion at the end. And so that's something that we'll actually go back to if you just want to be adding to the chat, which will be saved and sent out. Um, go ahead and put that in the chat box. Something else I want to draw attention to is when you are going to send a message in the chat box, you can choose who you're sending it to. So just to draw your attention to, it says two, and then it says um, you can choose everyone or you can choose panelists. And so just if you choose everyone, you can be talking to every all the other folks who are participating, um, who are viewing the, the webinar. So that's um, almost 50 of you right now. Um, so uh, those are just some of the um, some of the housekeeping things. Uh, so yeah, you're already interacting in the chat. Um, we will have a Q and A session at the end. Until then, um, we are going to run through our slides with the panelists that we're lucky to have here with us tonight. Um, so yes, let's let's hop in. <laughs> As someone said, really exciting to hop into compost. Um, so this presentation is part of the ongoing education we do for EcoCycles volunteer eco leaders, and we're happy so many of you have joined, and we're also thrilled that so many new folks who are not necessarily or officially eco leaders yet have joined us for tonight's conversation about composting. If you aren't a volunteer eco leader officially yet, but you would like to know more about the program, we'd love to chat with you because you're already doing what we ask of the eco leaders by joining this training. Eco leaders are just folks in our community who stay connected to us through trainings like these, through e newsletters, um, who then share the info they've learned with their networks, who answer questions from their coworkers, neighbors, friends, family, everyone they um, interact with, and who would consider them a peer to peer resource. We also have many ways beyond that for folks to get involved. So there's lots of ways for you to fit in, um, some of which we'll highlight at the end of this training. And if you'd like to talk more about becoming an eco leader, uh, please email volunteer at ecocycle.org. And again, we'll send out that email. We'll send out all of these resources at the end. Um, as always, our eco leaders um, and interested friends are our most valuable asset, truly really the reason that we as an organization exist today um, when it comes to educating the community. And we appreciate you being here so you can learn your knowledge or so you, so you can share your knowledge so you can learn some knowledge as well. And we'll give you a chance to ask questions at the end. So let's get started. Um, could we advance the slide, please? Rosie, I'm gonna have to um, stop screen share and try again. It's not advancing, so hang on. No worries. I will... Um, fill out... <laughs> Do some filling here. Um, we will show some photos when we get some slides up. Rosie, while Dan's doing that, why don't we go ahead and introduce ourselves? It's all right. Great. Um, I am Rachel Setsky. I am the senior policy and research associate at EcoCycle. So um, I'm going to mostly be talking about policy tonight, but we work very closely as a team. Dan, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or multitasking isn't the best right now. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm Dan Mach, and I am the director of the compost department at EcoCycle. 
And the slides like that, advancing. Go ahead. Amazing. Well, thank you. That was, uh, yeah, a perfect time for that little glitch. Um, thank you for having us introduce ourselves, Rachel. Um, yeah, my, my name is Rosie Briggs, um, just to hop on that. Um, I uh, historically am the Community um, Engagement and Education Manager and Ecoleader Program uh, Manager here at EcoCycle. I'm still very much committed to the EcoCycle Ecoleader Program and the EcoCycle Org, um, but uh, we are doing some reorganizing as I am graduating. So I there's a whole email about that, but just know that I'm very much here with the Ecoleaders and um, that I'm so excited to be joined by Rachel and Dan and Marty and Kylie here on this webinar and all of you. So uh, to get back to our slides, our content here, um, we, we just wanna let you know who EcoCycle is, if you're new here, or if, uh, just to remind you who EcoCycle is, we have a storied um, past. So we are one of the oldest and largest nonprofit recyclers in the country. We brought the first curbside recycling collections to Boulder back in 1976 using repurposed old school buses, these iconic buses you might remember if you were around then, making Boulder one of the first communities in the nation to have curbside recycling. Uh, we have provided those recycling processing, that recycling processing since those early days and continue to operate the Boulder County Recycling Center. And we um, opened the first center for hard to recycle materials. Uh, and we work with every sector of the community to work towards zero waste, including businesses, schools, government events, and the general public, our green star, the five points of the star. Um, and so our goal is to innovate new zero waste ideas here in Boulder County and then share that model as far and as wide as possible. So that's EcoCycle. But today we want to talk specifically about our work and what's going on generally with compost. So to do that, I want to introduce our first speaker tonight, Rachel Setsky, um, who works on, as she said, on policy here at EcoCycle, including composting policy. We're so lucky to have her. I've learned so much from her. Um, and I will turn uh, the, this next part of our training over to Rachel. Rachel, take it away. Sorry, it is not advancing. Let me try one more time here. So I can go ahead and tell you, um, thank you, Rosie. I've learned a lot from you as well in my time here. So EcoCycle has been championing composting for decades in addition to recycling. Our advocacy, which is led in large part by EcoLeaders, has helped to bring curbside composting to Boulder County and a number of the municipalities within the county. In addition to supporting our composting policy on the local level, we also work at the state level to champion compost bills, which we um, are doing. We have two right now in the legislature, and we'll talk more about those later tonight. And our schools department, which Rosie mentioned, works with school staff and with students to educate about composting. And we've implemented co composting programs in more than 60 schools in Boulder Valley School District and St. Vrain Valley School District. And we also have, um, as you can see, our truck, our new EV truck. Um, we have compost hauling services uh, for businesses and have worked with our customers to ensure that their compost is clean and meets these new guidelines. Um, our new EV uh, compost truck is the latest innovation that we're employing to move zero waste and zero emissions and composting forward. Let's see if we can move the slides forward. Ellie, do you have that PDF ready? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to plan B here. Sorry, folks. I do. All right, let's give this a shot. Can everyone see the first slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, we know that most of you are joining us tonight because of, or because you know of the new compost guidelines in the front range. Compost haulers and municipalities all along the front range of Colorado have been working together, that includes uh, EcoCycle. We've been working together with a regional compost manufacturer, A1 Organics, to ensure that organics material that is collected from businesses and residents are, as clean, uh, are clean enough to create a high quality and clean finished compost. We're in this together and with the goal of keeping food scraps and plant and yard trimmings out of the landfill and to prevent harmful methane emissions that they make there. 
Um, these new guidelines are also in place to help ensure that we are not throwing items that contaminate the compost stream into our compost bin. The guidelines are new to the front range. And if you weren't already aware, the guidelines say we just want food scraps and yard and plant trimmings. No more, no other items anymore. They, these guidelines are new to the front range but they've been in place in other places throughout Colorado and throughout the country for many years, sometimes for decades. Um, and they're very similar to those other places. And they are also in a direct response to the growing problem of contamination. Contamination compost streams can include lots of different types of items like glass bottles and aluminum cans that we know should have gone into the recycling. They also include garbage, uh, shoes, diapers, and other just plain garbage that should have gone into the trash. But increasingly in the last five to 10 years, in particular, uh, we know that contamination is coming from lookalike products that are often mislabeled in ways that confuse consumers. And a lot of these products contain petrochemical plastics and they really should be landfilled. And we're gonna talk more about those products later um, this evening. When compostable products just like plates or cups or kitchen scrap bags were first introduced, uh, there were just a handful of lookalike products. Most of the products on the market back then really were pretty good products. They were, they were good, useful vehicles for getting food and yard scraps to compost facilities. But as consumers have become more environmentally conscious and interested in buying products and that are better for the environment, the number of products that have been falsely marketed in ways that confuse consumers into thinking they are compost, that they're compostable has increased. In, uh, EcoCycle and our partner municipalities and, and partner compost businesses were working on a multi-tiered approach to clean up this compost stream. It includes state policy, which like I said, we'll talk about later, and also education campaigns, including this webinar. We really appreciate your being here to learn more about this. And the new guidelines, of course, are one of our approaches. Next slide, Ken. Thank you. Uh, these are actual shots provided from A1 Organics. On the left, you can see an example of contamination challenge at its worst. And you can see that the contamination isn't just an issue of lookalike products in here. It's also a blatant failure to follow the guidelines. Um, and contamination like plastic bags, non-compostable materials like rugs, and even diapers, as I mentioned before, are common in materials collected from municipal programs. On the right, you can see that A1 also has some beautiful, clean compost products. Our goal is to help people understand that when they use the cart, we're not giving the cart to make waste go away. It's to make beautiful compost like we see on the picture on the right that the agricultural community can use and that we can use too on our own lawns and gardens. So we're trying to get from the left to the right so that Next slide, please, Kylie. So that we can do all of these things. We want and need clean compost to make our yards, parks, and gardens healthier and to build better soils for our agricultural lands. In none of these places is it okay to apply compost that is fouled with contaminants like plastic bits and microplastics, sharp metal pieces, or broken glass. These contaminants are dangerous for our pets and people to walk on and play on. And in the cases of microplastics, they get into the plants we grow and subsequently into the animals that eat those plants, including humans. And research has found that the buildup of microplastics in bodies can cause health problems, including gastrointestinal disorders, immunity um, issues, respiratory problems, cancer, infertility, and um, alterations in chromosomes. Cleaning up our compost stream will help us build the beautiful, healthy compost that we do want around our homes and agricultural lands. Dan, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, for starters, I, I want to, to emphasize that composting is not broken. This, these guidelines are, uh, are an evolution um, there's a lot of hand wringing going on, I know, um, but you know, I, I think you know it. It harks back to me to 
how recycling was in the 80s. And I was participating in recycling in the 80s. Uh, I worked for Recycling Ann Arbor back then. And, um, you know, we, we didn't have the education. We didn't have the, um, the infrastructure. And we didn't have the end markets. Um, so all those things, uh, you know, Boulder has been, re has been composting since 2005. But a lot of the other programs are very recently, you know, uh, there's a lot of new folks getting into this and there's a lot of new material being collected. So um, so it is an evolution. Um, I'll say the one thing that is different um, between composting and recycling is, um, you know, with recycling, we have, you know, millions of dollars of sort sorting equipment over there at, at the Boulder County Recycling Center to, to clean up the stream uh, before it goes to the um, to the end user, to the um, to the secondary recycler. Uh, with composting, if you put it in the bin, it goes to the composter, and uh, the the composter has limited ability to get that out of there. Uh, and you know, it's not all on us. There, 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 there is some um, some new you know equipment that needs to be um, implemented, and some some new strategies put in place to deal with contamination. But really, you know, what I'd like you to consider is when you're when you're using your organics bin, your compost bin, um, curbside bin, don't think of it in terms of managing waste and 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 it going away. <laughs> Excuse me, going away. Think of it in terms of these are resources to make compost that I'm going to use. So what do I want to put in my compost? And I think that that is, if everybody does that, we're golden. Um, so, um, so first of all, a little bit of a big picture on, on uh, um, where we are, uh, how, how, or uh, what a little bit of describing of, of organic, the, the, the realm of of organic um, waste as part of, of our municipal waste stream. Um, so Colorado landfills, a whole lot of organic waste right now. Um, so uh, food scraps and yard trimmings. Um, it's over a third of all the material that we that we put in our landfills. So um, if we think about keeping those materials out, first of all, think about all that space that we're saving in, in the landfills. Um, nobody wants to live near a landfill. So, you know, siting a new landfill is, is really tough. Um, and we, and we want to make the best, best use of the, the landfills that we have. So, so saving that space, that's number one. Number two, uh, you, as you probably know, when you put organics in the landfill, um, that is a, um, that, you know, those compactors run over it to to take all the oxygen out of um, out of the pile. Uh, so you have this anaerobic environment that creates methane. when when you have when you have organic matter in an anaerobic environment, methane is created. And so as a result of specifically um, methane coming out of landfills, um, that is a third uh, or that is the third largest source of of human made methane. And methane is, uh, in the short term, in the in a in a twenty year time horizon, it is eighty four times more potent than CO two as a greenhouse gas. So important to get that out of there. Okay, next slide, please. So um, conversely, um, if we are able to re to take these organic materials out of the landfill, um, we have an opportunity to create a circular economy. And I think, you know, that's the, the real beauty of, of composting or uh, of, of, of organic waste is, um, you know, when, you, when you're recycling, a lot of that stuff is gonna go out of the state. Um, composting pretty much has to happen in the state or, or actually really close, you know, the closer the better. That's gonna be a, a, a primary message of, uh, of this webinar. Um, so, so it really is a demonstration of a local circular economy. Um, so we, you have, when you're diverting those materials, you can make compost, you can make biochar um, out of wood waste. 
Um, you're creating jobs. There's a study that um, that was done by Institute for Local Self-Reliance that showed that four times as many jobs are created um, by composting as opposed to landfilling materials. Um, it also creates local circular economies. Um, you in that you are, as I said, you're 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 generating a finished product, hopefully really close to the point of, of uh, where it was, I'm sorry, you're producing a finished product really close to the point where it was generated. So it's, uh, you want to so make it available for end use. That is, that is a really key piece of this is, you know, if we can make it visibly available for end use, um, that's, that's going to help a lot um, in, in people's understanding, it, it'll help with our education um, program. Um, and there is, there is a, a high demand for, for compost. Um, it's, it happens to be, you know, there's, they're five times higher than the, than the current supply across the state. So we're importing compost from other states right now. Um, we, do, we have had a, a dramatic growth in the number of compost businesses ar around the state. It's been mostly these, um, small bucket collector, uh, collection companies um, and they are very much wanting to get into this and they're very much wanting to not just do collections they want to compost themselves and and the the folks the businesses that are doing this um it's uh, it's a it's a it's great to watch it's really exciting to watch this um this entrepreneurial spirit and it's especially exciting that so many of them are women uh it really um you know, looking around the state, uh, this is a this is a a woman driven business. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then looking at um, you know, looking further afield at uh, at, at looking at this globally, aside from methane, you know, starting to look at the soil. Uh, you know, we've always heard that you're that that we're. You know, I've, I remember hearing in, in grade school. You know, we're losing topsoil, and I had this picture. You know, I envisioned erosion happening, but you know, erosion happens because we are losing the organic matter, we're losing the the nutrient value in our soil, we're losing the min the the microbes in our soil, and that makes it susceptible to erosion. And and as a result of primarily the way we farm, but but manage lands in general, um, we've lost uh, a third of our topsoil around around the globe. Um, meanwhile, we've learned the last fifteen years or so that compost and uh, other means of building organic matter in soil uh, that may be our our best natural tool for drawing down carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, soil is the second biggest carbon sink um, on the planet, uh, um, second only to the ocean. And right now it's, it's losing a lot of that carbon. So we need to get that back in the soil. <clears throat> and then um, compost does a lot of other things when it's in the soil. It is, um, when you improve the, the the health of soil, you're really uh, you're you know we have we have climate change and drawdown that's awesome, but local resilience, especially here in the West, is such a big deal. Um, our weather is more extreme. Um, there's no question about it. Um, so you have you know what we've always had you know our our summer storms are these are often so 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 um uh they're short but violent right so um that tends to um it, it's it's we're 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 short on water in the west um so it's really important that we capture um uh, all of that rainfall when it when it comes we don't want it to to run off uh so when you have higher organic levels of organic matter in soil you are increasing the water holding capacity in soil um, and you're also increasing percolation in soil. So, um, you know, I hear people, I hear gardeners say all the time, um, I have really clay soil. Um, percolation means it's allowing that soil to open up and, and 
and absorb that rainwater. Um, and then, and then um, water holding capacity that has to do with, um, let's say, especially if you have really sandy soil, you know, I hear, I hear people saying, you have to water all the time because my soil is so sandy. Uh, well, or increasing your organic matter is the solution there too. So, so regardless of your soil type, um, increasing your organic matter is always the solution that brings you to that that delicious middle ground of uh, of um, uh, fertile soil that uh, that has all the benefits of, of both sandy and clay. Okay, next slide. Okay, so our compost vision for the future. Um, so. We need to look at not just composting. We look, um, you know, food waste. We all know that is. The, um, we know we waste a lot of food in our refrigerators. We know we we waste a lot of food, you know, on the fields, uh, you know, restaurants, buffet lines, all that stuff waste food. Um, so, so we need to to um, reduce the 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 amount of food that we're wasting. Um, get it to um, humans and animals to um you, you know if it hasn't if it's if it's still edible um then the second goal is to reduce contamination in compost we've already started to talk about that a little bit um recycle into our food scraps in yard trimmings in a, in a compost um and then play a part in um creating a strong demand a strong end market for compost um, so those are those are our big overarching goals. Our our big overarching um, uh, bullets for how we get there. Uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna expand on these. So first of all is um, behavior change, uh, both individually um, as businesses as a community. Um, we need more infrastructure. We need diversified infrastructure. Um, we're going to talk about that. Policy is uh, uh, is uh, playing a big role right now. We're really excited about some of the policy work that's that's happening right now. Um, I'm going to kick it back to Rachel in in a few slides, and she's going to talk about that. And then um, education and advocacy, um, meaning um, you guys, eco leaders. Go ahead, next slide. So first of all, let's talk about behavior change. Um, so as I mentioned, that that's individuals um, or or other. Um, these guidelines, you know, we get a lot of questions. You know, how long are these guidelines going to be in effect? Can we get back to using compostable ware? Um, you know, the answer from our composter is, uh, you know, it's it remains to be seen. You know, first of all, we we need to make clean compost. Period. Uh, the uh, A1 needs to be able to see when a truck dumps, they need to be able to see, is that clean material or is that not clean material? Uh, that's how you make clean compost. Um, then I, I think, you know, we, we, we have um, all the combinations of the, of the um, things that I just mentioned. How do we get there? Um, if those all uh, show that we are capable of making clean compost and even if we are able to to introduce um, reintroduce, say um, soil paper or compostable products, uh, then we will go back. But but it's it's a um, you know consider it indefinite right now that the uh, that these gu guidelines will stay in effect. Um, a big part of this is weaning ourselves from single use products. And we're gonna we're gonna finish the webinar uh, talking about specifically, um, you know, some tips on how to do that. You know, there's no getting around it. It's tough. We are pretty addicted to single use products, uh, but some of us are old enough to remember a time when there weren't so many, and we were okay. Um, you know, we still went out to eat. Um, we still did a lot of the things that we do today. So it is possible. Um, and you know, it's really exciting. We got this new um, election <laughs> electric uh, collection truck. Um, we are going to utilize that to um, 
to create a little bit of an incentive for for businesses to to make clean compost um and they're doing it they are uh, there's a lot of our our business customers are stepping up they're doing what they need to do to um uh to get their stuff composted when we come to pick it up it's you know we we check it uh the driver checks it every time now uh, and if if they see contamination they're they're going to leave a note and say you got to clean this up before we're going to pick it up so so businesses are really rising to that challenge and and the little carrot that we're going to be dangling to them is if you if you're consistently if you're if you're what you put out is is consistently clean we're going to create a, a clean route um, using our clean compost truck, um, and we will promote those folks. So, um, uh, so I think that's going to it's going to be fun uh, having an electric truck. Um, and you know, it, I will say it, it's it's not on us alone. Um, we do need a comprehensive strategy. Next slide. Okay, um, talk a little bit about infrastructure now. Um, so this is a um, a heat map that was from a project that we um, convinced the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, our who is who regulates compost facilities in Colorado. Uh, we convinced them to create a statewide organics management plan uh, that they finished last year. Um, this map is a little bit hard to follow but what you're looking at is so all those dots are maps of uh compost facilities that are permitted in the state of colorado and you're it's i can't even read it myself on, on my small screen here but this small the, the the darkest blue dot there is for um class three compost facilities class three means um, that is a facility that is allowed to accept food waste for composting. And you can see that there's not a lot of those dark blue dots. Um, in the um, in the more shaded metro front range area, that shading indicates that there's a higher population. You see that there are four blue dots. Um, there's actually only, only one of those blue dots that actually accepts post-consumer food waste that's a one organic so for that entire shaded area that's three quarters of the population of the state we have one composter right now um meanwhile we have had a steady growth in um in collection programs in fact i would say it's it it's been an accelerated growth you know city of denver is um ready to come on uh, you know they they put the brakes on since since these guidelines came out but you know um that's going to be huge um uh, so um so we need the infrastructure to keep up with the collection programs next slide um so i mentioned uh the, the department of public health and environment as the as the regulator um uh, as the permitter for compost facilities um, those permits that they give out, the um, the 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 regulations are um, conceived originally with the notion of a giant regional compost facility as being what they are permitting. So a one um, that that is what the regs were written for. Um, so so this is this is our this is our current situation where we have a number of communities contributing materials to one distant composter um in talking to with a1 I'm, I'm sorry with with uh department of public health and environment cdphe uh, if i can if i can use that acronym um in talking to cdphe in creating that organics management plan um we uh we you know we participated in the last um uh update for of uh, the regs in 2017 um and you know we had a, a very easy conversation with with cdphe saying okay how many compost facilities have you permitted since those regs went into effect in 2017 the answer is two meanwhile uh we have uh greenhouse gas diversion goals for the state we have um greenhouse uh i'm sorry greenhouse gas um reduction goals we have 
um, waste diversion goals for the state. Um, there's no way we're going to get there with this model because there's really, um, there's really, you know, th there's only so many large regional compost facilities that we could put in this state. So CDPG understands fully that we need to look at these regs with a really critical eye and and create opportunities. I mentioned these entrepreneurs, all these, uh, especially the women-owned businesses, but but a whole bunch of entrepreneurs chomping at the bit to get into um, actually compost, doing compost production at whatever scale works for their business. Uh, right now, they are mostly limited to what's called conditionally exempt, uh, which is they have to be really small. Uh, they can only process five cubic yards of 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 food waste at a time. That's that is um, what the intent of conditionally exempt is. Was that's for the really uh, avid backyard gardener. These people are trying to run a business as an avid backyard gardener, essentially, uh, or backyard composter, rather. Sorry. Um, so so CPHE understands we need to 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 raise that limit to like say 10 or or 20 cubic yards for conditionally exempt. And we also need to create additional steps to allow these entrepreneurs to start small, you know, make sure that they uh, can compost at scale and, and, you know, like any business grow um, organically over time. Uh, next slide. So this is more what we're envisioning now. Um, we, meaning EcoCycle and CDPHE, are uh, uh, are on board with this idea of let's create as as distributed a compost infrastructure as we possibly can. Let's make it um, community based as as much as we possibly can. And I think there's going to be there's a lot of iterations of that. There's these entrepreneurs. Um, there's we have. Um, we have large campuses or other major generators of food waste. Uh, maybe they could be composting on on campus on site, uh, such as CU. Uh, we have um, we have remote communities in in uh, Boulder County that are not served by a traditional hauler. Uh, maybe they could be composting um, within those communities. Um, so a lot of different ways that that this can this will need a lot of different ways that this needs to happen. You know, we need a we need a diversity of of models um, and a diversity of scales. Next slide. Um, and in order to do that, we also need a diversity of compost um, systems, um, compost infrastructure, uh, compost equipment, and so we are not looking at um, you know, just if, if you've ever seen a picture of a big regional composter, they have these giant, uh, you know, it's uh, acres and acres of these big windrows, you know, um, long piles of compost that get turned regularly. Um, uh, we need all of these things here. So, um, you know, don't we don't discount uh, backyard composting, uh, humid powered composting. You know, there's some really... Um, inspiring models of um, uh, community-based uh, composting that is, you know, that pairs, um, you know, perhaps a food insecure community that really needs a, to grow their own food. And in order to grow their own food, they need to grow their own soil first, um, if they're in a inner city, especially. Um, so so that's a, that's a key uh, piece that we need to address. Um, uh, then there is, um, the the image in the middle it says on site in vessel, uh, so in vessel means that it's fully contained. So what you're looking at there is it's it's basically like a roll off container um, with with a greenhouse on top. And what you can't see in that picture is there's an auger that moves around that moves that moves through the compost and it slowly moves it mixes it and aerates it and it also slowly moves it. Uh, from one end of the of the vessel to the other. So what we're looking at is the um, uh, that that little yellow um, thing there on the right. That's 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 a toter tipper. That's that that's the input. And then it goes. And then um, about three weeks later, it comes out the other side as finished compost. Um, then uh, bottom left. Um, you may have heard us talk about, uh, we're excited about this, um, a technology called aerated static piles. Uh, we're doing 
on-farm demonstrations of that. There's a slide of that in a little bit here. Um, that can happen on any scale, and that's the point of the demonstrations. It can happen. It can be very simple, like this on-farm one here. It can also be a, a commercial program, a commercial entity. Um, all those all those concrete bunkers there, That's those are all aerated. Uh, so that's the primary composting. So rather than rather than having to turn those those piles to, to introduce oxygen, uh, the oxygen is pumped up uh, through it uh, with these with these pipes. Um, and then there's a the traditional windrow on the on the um, on the bottom right. Next slide. So our vision here is, um, I hope this graphic helps um, helps for an understanding of the vision. Um, so if we if we're able to create a a, a more local community based compost infrastructure, obviously we're greatly reducing the transportation emissions. You know, right now all those trucks are going to A1 Organics is 50 miles away, not just from Boulder, 50 miles away from Denver, 50 miles away from Fort Collins. Um, it's just 50 miles away. And, you know, and then if you wanted to get that compost back, it's 50 miles back. Uh, so huge reduction in transportation emissions. Um, it's an opportunity to create local pride. It, uh, you know, if you're a gardener, you want the local compost, right? You want the compost that you know how they made it. Uh, so that's a really important piece. Um, I already mentioned at the at the beginning this idea that we want to uh, we want folks to understand that um, the goal is not waste management; it's creating a valuable feedstock for clean compost that you're going to use yourself. And then finally, we do have um, uh, we, we want to use that. We want to prioritize using that local compost locally. Um, especially for, um, you know, but creating green jobs to to uh, in making the compost, and then uh, and then especially uh, making a high quality compost that that helps local agriculture. Um, you know, we're and and that creates uh, to create a more resilient food system. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's another one that's going to be fuzzy on us on a small screen, but I love this image of this uh, this slightly different version of an EPA uh, inverted uh, hierarchy for uh, for organics. Um, this one really kind of, thank you, this one this one really kind of uh, brings home, uh, this is from Institute for Local Self-Reliance in Washington, DC. And I think it really brings home this idea that there's several tiers above composting. Um, you know, there's source reduction, uh, there's there's saving edible, there's rescuing edible food, uh, there's composting at home, there is small scale decentralized composting, as I was just describing, um, medium scale. You know, I think I I still think there is a um, there's a uh, there's a place for medium scale composting, hopefully in or very close to Boulder County. Then you get to centralized composting, um, and and finally, you have uh, mechanical, biological, mixed waste treatment. Um, the last two are, are um, last resorts. You know, um, those are not terribly helpful. Landfilling or mechanical, biological treatment. What that means is essentially trying to compost trash. Doesn't work so great. Okay, I think I'm handing back to Rachel now. Next slide. Thanks, Dan. I want to. Um... Before I hop into my slides, just reiterate a couple points that Dan made. We keep talking about producing compost to support local agriculture. Please remember that local agriculture can be super local. It can be your garden or your yard. We all need to help build the, um, the demand for finished compost. So if you have any say in um, if adding compost to the grounds around your business or your church or your school, we all can help build that demand for compost to help make the whole system work better. Um, and I also wanna just strengthen a little bit or talk a little bit more about what Dan mentioned. 
um, about the growth in programs locally around composting. Just like there's different types of compost infrastructure, like Dan was talking about, there's also different ways that we are seeing municipalities in Colorado interact with composting companies. It's been really exciting to see the growth in the businesses, but we've also seen some really exciting programs through different municipalities, just like we've seen different ways that municipalities interact with recycling. So for instance, I live in Louisville and the city of Louisville has a contract that includes curbside composting. So all of the residents in single family homes, we have access to composting through a curbside. Um, down the road quite a ways in um, Edgewater, for instance, there's a contract, they have a contract for recycling and trash, but then they also have a separate contract where their residents can opt into a program with scraps, which is one of the smaller compost haulers. So they're trying to address access to compost in a slightly different way. And, and there's benefits to both. I won't go into details unless people have questions later. Um, there's other municipalities that have contracts or, or or partnerships with compost haulers where they have um, membership discounts for their residents to participate in drop-off. So they'll have some centrally located drop-off sites, maybe at a, a library or a city hall and residents that wanna participate in that program can be a member of that. So it's really exciting to see this interplay between the growing businesses and municipalities that are trying to, de to deliver these services to their um, residents that are interested in it. So I will hop back onto my slides here. Um, We've mentioned a couple of these statistics previously in, in other slides, but some of them I think are really important and I wanna repeat them just, just because I know we're throwing a lot of information at all of you. Um, and because these numbers are the numbers that are, have really been driving our policy work. We know that Colorado recycles and composts 16% of our municipal solid waste. That means the discards that residents and businesses generate only 16% of that gets diverted from landfills. This is less than half the average, or uh, sorry, half the national average. And um, neither Dan or I could find a national average just for composting, but we know that the combined average nationally is about 32% of diversion. So Colorado is, is way behind and we are working very hard um, to bring us up to a much higher level. We know that we landfilled over 2 million tons of organic materials, those food scraps and yard trimmings in 2021. And we composted or diverted uh, just over 400,000 tons. So we landfilled five times as much organic material as we diverted in 2021. And as Dan mentioned, we know that the demand for finished compost is five times higher than what we're currently producing. So we are literally throwing away valuable resources for which there is a demand. And to address this problem in a systemic way, EcoCycle made a conscious decision a few years ago to expand our policy efforts from our local interactions, which we continue to do to the state level. Next slide, please, Kylie. So in 2017, um, EcoCycle created our first ever state of recycling report, which is now the state of recycling and composting report. This report was a groundbreaker in that it uh, put in writing how poorly Colorado was doing when it comes to recycling and composting, like I just mentioned. The report also highlights state leaders and the policies and programs that they're doing that can be emulated by other municipalities and frankly by other states. There are other states that look to Colorado now, both through our report and the other things that we've been doing. The report has been has generated both local, state, and national media coverage and has been referenced by municipalities when they've been seeking funding for programs for diversion, recycling, and, and composting. And it's also been referenced by elected officials to promote recycling and composting policies at local and state levels. As we launched this report, we also began educating state decision makers and strengthening our coalition of partners who were interested in recycling, composting, and waste reduction. 
EcoCycle has played a large part in the passage of all the policy achievements that are here on this slide. And we plan to continue to work on the state level policy to reduce waste and build circularity in Colorado. Over the past few years, Colorado has really become a leader in recycling and composting policy, starting with the creation of an enterprise fund, which is funded by a small fee on the tons of material that are tipped, um, the official word for when a, a dump truck goes and tips material into a landfill. So a small fee on that material as it's tipped in landfills in the front range. This front, uh, this fund, which is called the, the Front Range Waste Diversion Enterprise Fund, often referred to as FORWARD, it provides grant funding to recycling and composting uh, projects that businesses, municipalities, and schools in the Front Range can apply for. And it has provided millions of dollars so far in the last couple of years to these types of projects to build out recycling, composting, um, and zero waste uh, projects throughout the Front Range. Uh, shortly after that, we became the first non-coastal state to pass a statewide fee on single-use bags, which went into effect uh, this past January. And that will be followed next January, same, same law. Um, the next stage of implementation is next January, where single-use plastic bags will be banned, as well as styrofoam uh, takeout containers will be banned in January. And in June of next year, 2024, local municipalities will be allowed to make their own ban, own, pass their own ordinances banning single use plastics or banning plastics, which previously they had been um, prohibited from doing. Last year, and probably many of you remember all the publicity on this, um, last year we became the third state in the country to pass a producer responsibility program for packaging. What that means is that this law will bring free recycling to all Coloradans starting in 2026. It's going to be funded by producers, think of Coke, Pepsi, Amazon, L'Oreal, all those producers of goods. They'll pay a very small amount per package, so per can, per bottle, per box. Um, and when we say very small amount, we know that in countries where these programs have been in place for decades, those it's, it's usually less than pennies per can or box. So they'll pay a very small amount on the material in their packaging. It'll go to a fund and then that fund will pay for the build out of infrastructure for recycling around Colorado, as well as um, and the, and the access to recycling. Last year, we also passed a law that creates a circular economy center in Colorado. This is gonna be a center that will support businesses that are using recycled materials, including organic materials in their businesses to, to create new materials using these recycled materials. Both the producer responsibility law Actually, the, the Plastic Reduction Pollution Reduction Act, the, the response, producer responsibility law, and the Circular Economy Center, they are all in stages of implementation and EcoCycle and our partners are all working very hard to make sure that they're all implemented in ways that really do provide the best um, service and, and for Colorado to help us achieve closer to zero waste. And currently we are working on two bills in the state le legislature that focus on composting. So next slide, please, Kylie. The first uh, bill that we're working on is Senate Bill 23-253, which sets labeling standards on compostable products. This bill do does two things. First, it requires any product sold in Colorado as compostable, it requires that that product has been certified to ensure that it truly is compostable and it has to be clearly labeled to make sure that it's easy for consumers and composters to clearly identify it as compostable. Um, the second thing that it does is it prohibits the use of confusing language such as biodegradable or plant-based. Um, while there are tests to determine whether something is actually compostable and will compost, terms like biodegradable and plant-based, there's no scientific way to measure those. Um, 
and, and they really don't mean anything. They're marketing words and that are used to sell products to well-intentioned customers who are willing to pay a little more often to buy eco-friendly products. And you'll see the, the graphic on this slide are some fictional brands, but I think we all have seen products like these, like the green plastic bags, and you pick them up and you think, well, it's green. Does that mean it's compostable? I really don't know. And to be honest with you, folks at EcoCycle, folks at A1, we have a hard time telling a lot of the time as well. So that's why this this is important. It's not something that that you know some of us can tell really easily and some can't. This is a really big problem that's confusing on a lot of materials. So with this bill, we intentionally modeled it on legislation that has passed in the state of Washington and the state of California, because our intent is, is that we want producers to do the right thing. We do not want producers to have a patchwork system of laws that they have to comply with in different states. We're really hoping to make it very easy for the good actors that are already getting certified and labeling most of them, hopefully, um, clearly to make it really easy for them to continue doing the right thing. And to make it really clear, if you're doing the wrong thing, if you're mislabeling your products, that's not okay. And we are very hopeful that be, if we can become the third state to do this, and if a couple other states will do this, that they'll become national momentum or the national momentum that's already there will be stronger and we might end up with a national level law that that really clarifies um, how to label compostable materials. We want to be clear, though, this bill will not require any business to accept compostable products. That's that's not our goal. Um, it's intended to eliminate the greenwashing of those look-alike compostables that often contain petrochemical plastics and make it so that compo composters can feel more confident about accepting more items if they choose to do so. Um, EcoCycle, when we first started looking into this bill, we ran a survey of composters in Colorado. We got responses from about 20 and sorry, there were 20, 20 that responded. Of those, 68% reported misleadingly labeled lookalike compostable, compostable products um, contaminating their incoming materials. So we know that this is a problem that composters all across the state are having. Again, of those 20 respondents, 74% responded that this bill would probably reduce contamination and may actually allow them to accept more compostable products. Again, this bill won't require them to do so, and maybe that's not even the end goal, but we really want to make it an option if, if we can clean up the, the stream. Um, Dan and I are actually going to be at the Capitol on Thursday. That's the next time the bill is being heard. It's going to be in the House Energy and Environment Committee, um, and so we'll be testifying there. The legislative session ends on May 6th. So we have a week, a little, little under two weeks to get the bill through the House and um, hopefully onto the governor's desk. We feel pretty good about that, except that there's a lot of bills going on. So you never know. And any support, if you haven't already reached out to your legislator on this bill or the next one I'm gonna talk about, we'd really appreciate it. Next slide, please, Kylie. All right. So the next bill that we are working on, and you see here the picture of uh, Senator Cutter. I should have mentioned the previous bill. Sen Senator Cutter is the prime sponsor in both of these bills. Um, the previous bill, hopefully I get this right, the previous bill, Representative Froelich and Representative, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> it is escaping my mind, but I'll put it in the chat later. She is from Boulder are the co-sponsors on that one. And this one, the co-sponsors are Representative Kip and Representative Junie Joseph from Boulder. Um, so this bill is Senate Bill 23-191. It is also being heard in the House on Thursday. So Dan and I have a busy day on Thursday at the Capitol. Um, this, this bill is one that builds on the organics management plan that Dan was talking about earlier on the slide that had the map on it. Um, the, it's taking what is a very high level plan. That was the intention of that plan. It's taking that high level plan and, and creating a plan that's the next steps. 
We know that many local Colorado jurisdictions are interested in building out composting infrastructure for a variety of reasons, including supporting local composting businesses, which we've talked about, lengthening the life of their landfills and providing compost to local farmers, ranchers, and residents, and achieving the climate change goals that they've set for themselves. And unfortunately, as Dan talked about earlier, building out organics infrastructure isn't simple. There's lots of different things that a community would need to think about. Uh, lots of decisions that go into what type of infrastructure best meets the needs of the area. And those decision points might be how dense the population is or what altitude the community is at, what types of materials they generate. You know, on the plains, there's not nearly as many trees as there would be in a mountain town or a tourist town that has lots of food scraps during high season, but not so many food scraps during, during low, se low tourist season. So there's a lot of decision points that weigh into what type of infrastructure would be best. And the goal of this bill is to look at best practices that, it, that we already are seeing in Colorado and ones that we're seeing all around the country so that CDPHE, the Department of Public Health and Environment, can create a toolkit that local governments can use to help make those decisions. The bill also asks CDPHE to list funding sources that will support the build out of that, that composting infrastructure, and also to look at policies that other states have used to help um, incentivize the diversion of organic material from landfills and help create a strategy for future uh, state legislat legislative action to make for more um, incentives for diverting organics. Next slide, please. Dan, I think that's back to you. Yes, thanks. Um, there is one federal bill that didn't make the slides, but I'll <clears throat> mention very quickly. It's called the Compost Act, and our Congressman Jonah Goose is one of the sponsors. Um, what the Compost Act uh, aspires to do, and he it was introduced last year, and as you know, on the federal level, a bill can can last for can uh, be considered and uh, put on the back burner for years. Um, uh, what the Compost Act does is, it first of all, it requires each state to create an organics management plan. Uh, so Colorado has already done that. Um, that's exactly what they're looking for each state to do. Look at, um, you know, what, uh, what, what material, what organic material in what volume is being produced where in the state, what compost infrastructure is there in the state. Um, and then create a, a plan to you know best utilize that resource. And that's what the organics management plan does. Uh, so that will be a central uh, starting point um, in the Compost Act. Um, it also um, directs infrastructure act dollars towards composting and incentivize it and it looks to create incentive incentives for end use of compost, especially um, in agriculture. Um, so the the plan with that with this bill right now is to get it incorporated into the next farm bill which um gosh i've lost track of when the next when the farm bill is is due to come back up but it uh but but that's the plan for the compost act so it's exciting to see um something going on at the federal level um uh, as we because it would be great to you know we do have the the infrastructure dollars starting to trickle in but to have them really directed to compost would be very helpful um okay so um back to um what ecocycle is doing um we are trying to um because we always we don't just advocate we try to demonstrate what we're uh, what we're advocating for, uh, we're we're doing the same in the in this realm is uh, starting to, uh, you know, as we wait for the for the um, for the state regulations to change so that we can look at at different levels of compost um, infrastructure, uh, different scales of compost infrastructure. What we can do locally right now is um, make some do some really small scale demonstrations. Um, so. Um, this this image in the center here sort of represents the what we've kind of already talked about um, this circular compost system that starts with clean discard. You know, everybody everybody contributing clean discards, 
it going to local composting infrastructure and it goes to local ag um so that they can and ag um the, the large definition of, of ag is as rachel said you know including your backyard so that we can all make healthy soil um which you know again um increases our local resilience no matter where that soil is um if you are if you're building that soil you are contributing to local resilience um so uh, that is a um the up the the image on the upper right uh that's a the we're carbon farming sign i'm sure there are some folks on this call who who participated in our three-year backyard carbon sequestration trial um so that's a um you know we we look to to do more of that citizen science community science projects um to help people you know understand the the goals you know basically the 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 goal of that project is to to generate a little bit of data but also to help people understand you know how does how manage how can i manage my landscape um to do the best carbon sequestration that was basically the point of that um we so i think the next step of community science uh, hopefully you're aware of this um 10 year project that's that city of boulder launched uh last year called cool boulder uh we are um uh we're working with with the city of boulder that's um you know it's kind of evolving how that how that works but there's uh, the idea is that there's lots of opportunities for participation. Whatever your interests are, uh, there will be um, opportunities for for participating in community science projects um, in that realm. So stay tuned for that. Um, and then on the left, we uh, there's there's uh, two images of our on farm projects. One is a carbon farming demonstration. Um, that is where we're actually using compost. Um, in uh, a hay field and a pasture um, just south of Longmont, two properties. And what we're trying to do here is uh, it's actually um, a scientific trial where we are um, trying to see can we take um, A1's standard uh, finished compost and tweak it to make a little bit of high higher value. You know, we heard uh, if you if you remember Boulder County's effort to create a a, a um, county compost facility a couple of years ago, um, some of the resistance to that was actually, you know, there was farmers testifying saying, "Well, I don't really like, um, you know, the the compost that A1 produces, so I, I don't think I'd be interested in this stuff. I want, I'm interested in high fungal compost." Um, I'm interested in compost that has these particular value uh, qualities. So we're trying to make a high fungal compost, starting with A1 by inoculating in a few different ways with mycelium. Um, and then the bottom left, um, that is an image of um, my pet project of helping local farmers um, uh, uh, building in partnership with with local farmers building aridocytic pile compost systems for their farms so helping them figure out how to compost on farm um, i used to be a farmer um you know composting seemed like practically a second business it's a, there's it's a lot uh, you know it's it's it was sort of a distraction from all the stuff that you have to do as a farmer already um if you make if you can make it simple for a farmer um and and make the and with have results that make really high quality compost um then then farmers are going to do it so um so that's that's the intent of this project we right now have uh two and soon to be three uh, uh farms that already have their own um pretty high visibility um outreach and education programs so that's olin farms in uh just south of longmont um, that's our friends, um, Long's Gardens slash Growing Gardens, um, just up in North North Boulder and right across this, um, the way from right across from us here at EcoCycle, uh, the Boulder JCC. The, there's a, a farm there called Milk and Honey. Um, so all three of those are getting these 
um, aerodynamic pile compost system. So if you remember my slide of the different kinds of compost systems, aerodynamic pile is the is the one that it has the pipes underneath it, and it is pushing air um, into the compost so that you don't have to turn it. And that's a, that is um, that's the way that we make it simple for compost for for farmers um, is they don't have to turn it. Number one, and we're helping them build build the compost uh, piles or a bunker for the compost in this in this case uh, that that um, contains it in a way that um, that makes the um, uh, with with an aerated static pile system. You have to make sure that air goes all the way through the pile. So uh, so um, they're designed in a way that that makes sure that the air is dispersed all the way through the pile evenly and that's how you get even comp how you get quality compost if it's even um and uh and yeah uh we we're gonna do one maybe two more more farms uh by the end of the summer um uh yellow barn farm for sure and possibly one more you know, looking at um it, it funds it's grant funded primarily and also um, uh, private donations. So we'll see how the funds go. Um, if we can add one more, we will. Um, regardless, we will have uh, tours of these, um, both the carbon farming demonstrations and the aerodynamic static pile demonstrations. We will have on farm uh, tours. Um, I think we're going to have probably we're going to have three of them over the course of the summer. So stay tuned tuned for that. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so um, I mentioned Cool Boulder. Um, just a little bit more about that. Um, we are, there's three aspects to, to Cool Boulder. Um, pollinator pathways, that is the, um, the intent of, of, of that is to, um, uh, to create uh, corridors throughout the city Boulder um, for, for pollinators so they can do their thing. Um, connected canopies is about uh, planting trees. Uh, we've uh, we've lost a lot of ash trees due to emerald ash borer, and there's parts of the of the city that just don't have a lot of trees. And you um, so an early project with with Cool Boulder was people were riding around on their bikes with thermometers that were recording the temperature on the hottest day of the year, July 14th last year. Um, and we were, uh, and lo and behold, uh, finding that where there was not shade, it's a lot hotter. So um, if we can create more shade in the city, um, that is a great way to um, to create more resilience. Um, and so the the piece that that EcoCycle is championing is is the last one that's absorbent landscapes. That is um, making sure that our uh, that our soils function. Um, uh, you know, they 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 work within the carbon cycle well. They're they're sequestering carbon. Um, uh, they the soils are as I mentioned before. They're they're holding water. They're percolating well. Um, that's that's good to uh for for preventing flood, and most importantly, they are supporting these plants for uh for the entirety of their of their life. So if you're planting a tree, you know that's thirty plus years. So uh, it's important what you plant those trees into. So that's a, that's a piece that we're carrying for Cool Boulder. Next slide. Okay, so the um, the last, um, how we get there, if you remember that slide, the last piece was um, to, you know, recycling is, or recycling slash composting, that's just one of the R's, right? So, uh, how do we reduce and reuse? And that is um, that's something that we really want to double down on here at EcoCycle and with our partners um, like the City of Boulder. Um, so um, the the image on the right uh, uh, is of a um, a to go container, a reusable to go container. There is a it's a business called Deliver Zero. Um, they are working directly with City of Boulder uh, to, or City of Boulder is is helping um, uh, uh, businesses, uh, food food related businesses, um, restaurants with with to go um, functions, 
um, giving them a, a reusable option that's easy. Uh, you know, a lot of restaurants don't have kitchens um, that are big enough to do uh, dishwashing. Uh, this makes it really easy for a restaurant where there's a business that um, that delivers these um, these uh, reusable containers, picks them up when they're dirty, washes them, brings them back. So it's it's a beautiful uh, little little system that is spreading pretty quickly through City of Boulder um, uh, that we're really excited about. And then and then similarly similarly, um, our cup is another. Uh, such business with a uh, specific, specific focus on um, uh, uh, coffee houses uh, to do the to make do essentially the same thing there. And I uh, I'm not sure how they operate. They might have. I think you have to you have to bring it back to the um, to the coffee house. I'm not sure. Um, there was an uh, Rachel. Are you coming? And you might have pop in. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit more about our cup. I know that they are working in a lot of, of venue spaces, particularly in Denver. Um, and you know, if you're at an arena or a, a show, um, it's a closed campus, sorry, co closed campus. And so it's easy, you know, when you go to the bar, instead of getting a glass glass or getting a, a single use plastic cup, they're using all of the R cups. And, and so people have those when they're there. And then when they walk out the door at the end of the show, they drop it in a bucket or collection bin and, and are able to have that reusability. And then again, like Deliver Zero, our cup comes in and collects all those dirty cups, washes them, returns them back to the venue. So it makes it a simpler system for the venue. Sorry, I didn't mean to butt in. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. I'm happy to take the rest of the slide too, since I put it together kind of last minute. Go for okay. it. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to point out, um the our ev truck on here again um one of the cool features of that truck is actually that it has a um a hose inside of it so that it, that we can hose out the bins anyone who has a compost toter or a compost bin at their house or business knows they can get kind of funky and so we can wash out those bins for our customers and there's other companies if you have a business and you're not one of our customers but you you want your um your toter rinsed out there's other ones that can do that for you so that you don't have to use those compost bags it's another way to reduce and then finally on here these colorful rags just to remind us that there's simple ways to reuse in our houses to get houses or businesses to get away from those single use you know single use paper towels i you know you can use the fancy schmancy buy them at a store ones or Personally, I've got a whole lot of shredded t-shirts and sheets that I use for cleaning that work just as well. So if we can get back to those practices that some of us grew up with or parents or grandparents grew up with um, to think about how can we get away from the single use in our, our daily lives or in our businesses. And Rosie, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, can we do the next slide? Please, Ty. So I just want to calmly remind everyone that uh, a lot of times, especially when I run a webinar, it's like information, information, okay, questions. And then there's like 10 minutes left because there's truly so much, there's no end to how much we could talk about zero waste here at EcoCycle. But I do want to calmly remind everyone that this webinar is a two hour webinar. So we're actually doing great on time in terms of questions. So if you're worried that your specific composting questions are not going to be answered in the next 10 minutes. That's okay. We will do our best to get them answered um, in a timely manner, but this is um, this does go to 7.30. So we will really try to be attentive to everyone's questions. And I see a lot of really thoughtful interaction in the chat and in the Q&A. So thank you so much. And again, continue putting questions that you want to specifically be addressed by the panelists, please, in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, but both will be saved and sent out um, in addition to the slides and reference links um, in a follow-up email. Um, so this is just our final uh, call to action slide with that said. Um, and so as we jump into questions, we just wanna summarize, uh, Rachel and Dan have done a great job summarizing uh, the takeaways to, again, this very complex issue and an ever-changing issue. Um, but the, the calls to action for you as a person watching this webinar 
um, is as we've been talking about throughout um, this presentation, as well as I've been seeing a lot of uh, kind of consumer related um, uh, discussion in the chat box is just uh, being a conscious consumer. And, um, and as I just saw Sherry Malloy put in the chat, uh, when we're looking at the hierarchy of waste management, um, reduce and reuse come first uh, structurally. So um, all of that is still relevant, whether we're talking about composting or recycling or just waste management, um, resource management in general. Um, being a compost champion and really learning what the process of composting looks like is a really important part of this. So um, you can tell that that we're all really excited about composting and um, you know you can tell Dan has spent years as as an organic farmer and at that getting our fingers in the dirt and interacting with the worms and really knowing what composting is about um, is a big part of why we're so passionate about this um, issue. And so the more that our advocates can also gain um, an appreciation for really the process of um, composting and then also share that with others, uh, the better we're going to be able to build infrastructure for it. So um, again, engaging on all different levels. So whether you're compost, um, you're composting in your backyard or you're supporting um, circular economy through and adding value to those products by, by uh, purchasing micro brew and um, locally produced compost, that's great. And then spreading the compost word. So again, you already made a huge, um, you already did, did a great step by coming to this webinar. Again, we can't tell you how much we appreciate you showing up out of concern for the same things that we're concerned about, um, especially so close and or around dinner time. Um, and so sign up for legislative action alerts. Again, we're going to send out a follow-up email with all of these um, links so you can just have them all in one place. You can sign up to be an eco-leader if you're not already. Again, there will be a link there. You can join us to table at Saturday's farmers markets um, in Boulder and Longmont and educate your networks. That's what being an eco-leader is all about. Just um, wherever you talk to people and wherever people know that you're already kind of the environmental person to talk to, um, this is the information that's really helpful to spread um, because that grassroots movement is where we are able to make this infrastructural change um, like the really exciting stuff that Rachel and Dan have been talking about. Um, so that said, um, we have a final slide. Kylie, could you please? Um, it's just our thank you kind of um, summary slide. But um, I think we can go ahead and turn it over to uh, our Q&A time. Um, so this, uh, perfect, yeah. I will go ahead and facilitate um, the Q&A box if that's okay with everyone. And then uh, Dan and Rachel will, will be primarily addressing the questions. Um, again, thank you so much for being here as our experts. So um, Christina Bowen, so great to hear from you, Chrissy. Um, will the companies responsible for greenwashing be held accountable in any way? That's a great question. Um, we have worked with both the Department of Public Health and Environment and the Colorado Attorney General's Office to figure out the best way to have enforcement in our bill. Um, as it stands right now, the, the Department of Public Health and Environment will have a form. They'll create a form on their website that people can um, report offenders into, and then they will funnel those responses to the Attorney General's Office. And frankly, we're really hoping that just having a law on the books that codifies um, what you can and can't be doing or should and should not be doing, um, hopefully that will be an incentive for some, at least producers, to clean up their acts, particularly since there's going to be the same law in three states at least. Um, so hopefully that'll be enough incentive to get them moving, but there is a pathway through the bill to, for enforcement. Rosie, you're muted. I just got slippery Zoom finger or something today. Um, yeah, that was a great question. Thank you, Rachel. Um, this next question says, I've heard that the technology to sort composting at the point of processing exists, like similar to what we see at Boulder County Recycling Center in terms of contamination sorting ability but that A1 doesn't have or isn't willing to purchase such, such technology can 
Um, anyone speak to that? Uh, yeah, there. Um, I, I think it's I, it's more accurate to say it's um, it, it does exist, but it's 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 under development. I mean, there um, there is one uh, composter in California, um, San Jose, who has been doing. Uh, they've had a a sort line where they um, they break open bags of of organics and and go it, just like we have at the BCRC. There's folks then it then it goes down a conveyor line and there's folks picking the obvious contamination out. Um, you know that is that's simple technology. It's also really expensive, obviously. Um, you know, in coastal California, their landfill costs are a hundred dollars plus a ton. Um, here, they're you know about thirty bucks a ton. It, um, so it's it's tough to, uh, you know, part of its economics um, that it, that justifying that cost. Um, uh, but there's also um, it's it, you know you can get the big stuff out, but what about all those um, all those little bits of plastic in there? You can't you can't pick that stuff out. You have to have something else for that. Um, so there is not a uh, I mean there there's there there are machines that are um, intended for um, depackaging. They're called so so like if you have a truckload of uh, uh, milk that's spent, but it's all in jugs. You know, there's a machine that can, um, you know, uh, slice open those jugs. Hopefully, make them still available for recycling. Is the uh, is how they're sold anyway. Um, and then and then the milk goes to into compost. Um, those are really tricky to use, uh, and they are often misused. So, in, in you know, with with mixed um with, with a uh when you're when you're processing post-consumer stuff with all kind of all kinds of um you know contamination contamination could be anything uh you know from a boot to you know a little tiny piece of plastic it's really hard to you know say oh this magic black box will take care of that that doesn't really exist um i think um there what it what really is needed is you know it's a multi-stage approach you know you um Take out the big stuff up front. Try not to shred it up a lot, um, so because you're creating you know smaller smaller bits that are harder to get out. Um, and then maybe do a mid stage uh, screening. Um, and then the, there is a there's a um, the typically what any composter does is they screen the finished product, and that is that is the the stage at w which there are generally. Um, that is that's your 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 opportunity to to take out contamination. Um, but um, you know if you again, if you have little tiny bits, um, they're gonna go in the finished compost. So um, you know it it's a it takes sort of a, a comprehensive approach and it does take some money uh, that we um, that is that's hard to hard for a business to justify um, in our landfilling environment. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And um, someone in the chat in response to um, this kind of cost benefit analysis of um, of contamination sorting that you're offering said, so landfills should cost more. And yeah, we agree. <laughs> and so that's a big part of a lot of our um, infrastructural mission. So an example of that is the front waste race, uh, the front range waste diversion fund um, is making um, landfills more expensive as an alternative to zero waste, even though that's not the infrastructure that we're looking at. Um, anyway, yes, good point. And we're working on it um, is all I would add to what Dan said. And I will I will add to that. We also have in Colorado the, <laughs> I never remember what REO stands for, resource recovery <laughs> economic opportunity. It's another grant yes. program. It it's funded the same way as forward, but it's statewide and has similar granting programs for communities statewide. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, historically, uh, landfills are cheap here because we just got so much space in the West. 
So there's, yeah, there's a lot of reasons for that, but thank you. Okay, this next question says, it seems like the contamination was largely coming from downtown Boulder restaurants forced to compost without education and street side composting. Um, so I think this person is referring to the universal zero waste ordinance that was passed in city of Boulder. Um, I can't imagine municipal home composting sites were a major source of the problem. I'd like to know how we can start to move back toward composting things like paper that's too small to recycle but is compostable. Yeah, you know, those things are true. Um, generally, the residential stream is cleaner. It is still, there's still contamination. Um, and again, City Boulder, been doing it since 2005. Um, the city of Denver, uh, brand new. So, uh, and a lot of other places. So, um, you know, there, even so, you know, there, there is, there's education to happen that, that needs to happen there. Um, on the residential level, but certainly, yeah, you know, the, the um, before the guidelines change, you know, the the first thing that we tried back in August of last year uh, was that we eliminated um, the public facing collections, you know, that uh, so that's on the on the street, um, but also, uh, you know, at the front of the grocery store or at the front of the um, uh, a restaurant, you know, to go restaurant, so or a self busting restaurant, um, yeah, a lot of that's you know just super confusing for for people when you have a you know a cup that looks like it's plastic. Um, is it compostable or is it plastic? It's very very tough. Um, so, um, you know, I I think we get that a lot of you know people saying you know I understand, I just want to um, I know what I'm doing. I want to put in, you know, X, um, and we just have to ask for your patience right now. You know, that's, you know, a, a paper, you know, if you do backyard composting, I, you know, I, I put soil paper in my backyard composting. Um, we, you know, right now there is zero tolerance for anything that's not, uh, food scraps and yard trimmings. Um, you know, as I said, you know, they, it's all about, scanning that load when it comes out of a truck. And if they see stuff that's not one of those two things, uh, that whole load is in peril of being uh, of being landfilled. So uh, just ask that you please refrain uh, despite your um, all the education that you've received to this point <laughs> from us um, that that yeah, we have to just stick to that uh, to those two things. and and but all the things that we described, you know, hopefully that'll get us back to being able to to ex all the steps that we've been describing, hopefully that can get us back to a little bit of extended um, incrementally expanding those guidelines back. Matt, I'm gonna jump in here, and I am kind of pre-scanning a couple of these questions. I'm gonna answer maybe a couple of them at the same time. Um, with, along with the education, uh, the next question asks who's who's doing this really well. And as we've talked about, there are several, quite a, I don't know, five or six at least compost specific companies in the metro area. And EcoCycle is one of them. We we do very specific pickups of compost. We work with our customers, but there's also folks that work with residential customers. And, and these companies like EcoCycle and Scraps and Clementine and Compost Colorado, Wampost, there's a bunch of us. And, and the goal really is to get that clean compost. And so these companies really are working with their, their customers to make sure that that is done well. I mentioned earlier about municipalities trying different approaches to bring access to composting. Um, to residents and, and we see programs like Boulder or the ordinance in Boulder or the, the contract in Louisville or Lafayette that have that universal access, which is great from the access point of view. But when you have the free access or seemingly free access to compost, that's when sometimes we do see people treating their compost bin as another trash can. It's just a way to get a smaller trash can. And so they do just throw whatever in the trash bin. Whereas you also, when you get to the programs where someone's actually subscribing to a compost hauler, um, you know, they're, they're paying into it. They value it. They know it. They understand it. And they're, they're more likely to use it 
correctly and create clean compost. And this kind of conundrum of access versus cleanliness, it's very similar to the conversation that was happening happening in the chat earlier about equity and, and access and trying to build systems that create zero waste, but don't penalize people who have lower income. And we could, I think we have done an entire eco leader training on equity and we certainly could do more. Um, there are national conversations around reuse, around reusable bag programs and ordinances, around compost and recycling access around those points. So I don't have an answer. I wish I did, Tanya and other folks chatting about it. I really wish I did, but please know that we are participating in those conversations, both locally and nationally, trying to find solutions that help bridge that gap between access and the intended outcome, whether it be clean compost or fewer plastic bags or less polystyrene um, or styrofoam containers. Um, so that might be off topic or it might've answered a few questions. So Rosie, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, a thorough answer. And I just wanna recap that um, since uh, that, that answer went a lot of ways so that um, there was there is there was and is a lot of support um, for implementing the universal zero waste ordinance to restaurants and all stakeholders. It's not just go learn how to compost. So a lot of folks working on this again very complex issue. Thanks. Okay, the next question says with this composting landscape, yeah, it's not necessarily a crisis. Um, uh, there are lots of opportunities for careers and ways to make. Sorry, are there lots of opportunities for careers and ways to help? I'm so sorry. The font is very small. With this composting landscape rather than crisis, are there lots of opportunities for careers and ways to make big impacts currently? Who is doing good work to help with this currently? And how can we all help besides being more cautious with our own waste? So essentially, as we're looking at the organics management bill and we're looking at this huge context of organics, um, and the circular economy, all the pieces, how can folks get involved in that industry and support the infrastructure of it? Well, it is a circle. So, you know, you can, you can, there's entry points all the way around the circle. Um, you know, you know, I think, um, I will say that we're on the front edge of, you know, sort of a nationwide um, second look, I guess, at at uh, post consumer uh, composting and and realization that this of that we you know contamination is a challenge, infrastructure development is a challenge, um, end use is a challenge. Um, so, I think we're it, it, you. Know, I can't say, um, oh my gosh, there's so many jobs right now, but I think they're, I, I think they're, they're coming. I think, um, you know, um, coming from the ag side, I'm really interested in, you know, how can we create incentives for farmers to build soil? Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's, um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping like the, the ideal might be a, like a carbon market. I don't think that's going to happen in ag. Um, but I think there's um, hopefully there's businesses coming in that are, are that will um, that can that can support uh, farmers, uh, make it easier for them to spread compost, use compost, answer their questions about compost. Um, you know, I yeah, it's a, it's not a simple um, answer, but I I I, I think there's businesses or there's job opportunities coming, and you know, just look at you know where where is it interesting to you, you know, in that circle. Nice, thank you, Dan. Um, okay, Lori D, great to hear from you. Long time. Longtime listener, Lori D, longtime eco leader. Um, I, if you guys don't mind, just I would give you a break and just take this one really quick, unless you have some. Right, I, I'm sure both of you have lots of to, of thoughts to add. But um, Lori D says, why not capture methane at landfills? Waste management does this at the Denver Arapaho disposal Denver area disposal site. 
and converts it to electricity and powers up to 3,000 residents per year. So yeah, um, why not capture methane at landfills? We are capturing methane at landfills. But the, um, the point here is that in this scenario where organics are going to the landfill, some of the damage is mitigated via capturing that methane, but really just kind of burning it off. Um, that's just still damage control. It's still linear and it's just kind of damage mitigation versus over here, um, diverting those organics from the landfill, putting them in a composting infrastructure that makes sense, not only gets rid of the waste, but it also um, tackles emissions, not only in that it doesn't emit methane at all, but it, uh, as we said, has tremendous value in terms of carbon sequestration developed directly from the atmosphere. So over here, it's like, this is a band-aid for something to make it a little bit less bad environmentally. And then this one is uh, a solution rather than a problem. And so here at EcoCycle, of course, we're always going to advocate for this circular economy. That's what this is. It's adding jobs, it's adding value, it's adding nutrients back into our soil, it's sequestering carbon, it's getting rid of uh, waste, it's making landfills less uh, of, a, of a pollution problem to our atmosphere. And over here, it's just making uh, a linear um, emissions issue a little bit less impactful. Um, do either of you have anything to add there? I would just add that methane capture at landfills capture some or most in the best scenario of that methane, but it, there's always going to be leakage. So you're still going to have methane. So like Rosie said, the more you can keep the methane producing materials out of the landfill, the better. And yeah. you really can't, uh, you know, that the methane capture is most effective when that cell of the landfill is capped. So the whole point, the whole time that that, um, that that face of the landfill is active, it's 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 not it's not it's not capturing a lot of that methane. And of course, you know, the slimiest stuff is producing methane. You know, the day that it arrives there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, that's a good one. Okay, Celeste. Hi. Um, says, why is it better to think of compost as not managing waste, but making compost? And I think both of you touched on that really well in your slides, um, just in framing it as adding value back to, um, again, looking at it, it as a circular economy model. And um, uh, and that's not managing waste because that's linear. That's um, adding economic and multifaceted value back to our soil and our compost. Again, I'm just summarizing what you both said, but um, do either of you have something to add to what you've already presented or summarized? I think you got it. Yeah, I'll just reiterate that it, um, it, it what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, it, we're not going to address compost. We're not going to. Sorry, we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna solve contamination when people have this mentality. I'm gonna put my stuff on the bin here, and it's gonna go away, and I don't need to worry about it again. You know, we want people to think about. I want this to make good compost because I'm gonna use it myself, and so that's really what it boils down to. Totally, that personal engagement and connection is really key in understanding how the process works. Yeah. Um. Okay, Debbie says, how does A1 react to our encouragement of local composting? So like when we were pushing for the composting uh, facility for at a local county level, um, how does A1 feel about that? What's How do they fit into this? Well, I think they, they agree. They see that, um, you know, these collection programs are proliferating. Um, th and they're, they're the only game in town. Um, and they... You know, there's an expectation uh, when you know when a city um, decides it's it wants to create a collection program, A1 will take it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and A1 saying, you know, wait a minute, I want to, you know, it, it, this is not good stuff. Um, you're not doing sufficient education. Um, we can't make good compost out of that. So they understand that. Um, you know, it happens at the, the point of generation and and not all uh, collection programs are are able to impart that to to participants, residents and businesses. Um, so they so A1 A1 sees that there is a role for 
um, you know, that, that, yeah, I mean, there's, there is so much organic waste aside from the post-consumer way. You know, I mentioned all the, you know, the spent milk. I mean, you know, they, um, this is not a core part of their business. Um, they actually, you know, they compost biosolids, they compost, um, you know, yeah, uh, spent liquids, um, you know, they, they, they do industrial scale composting. Um, so they are not dependent on this, um, on this problematic, um, feedstock. Um, so they are, um, they're very interested in, um, in developing more infrastructure. In fact, you know, the, the, um, uh, they may participate themselves. I mean, they were going to, um, likely be the operator for Boulder County. Um, you know, they, they created that design and that was the, that was the expectation is that a one was going to operate that. So, um, you know, they may even participate in it themselves, but they, they see it. Right. Sorry. I was just, um, replying to one just so we can get through it through them by text. So just so that everyone knows there's on the Q and a thing there's open and answered. So if you want to see ones that have been answered, um, you can click on that tab. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tamar, hi, nice to uh, hear from you. Very active Louis Felica leader. Has there been any pushback on the 2024 styrofoam ban now that the compostable container is kind of an alternative um, being presented are no longer compostable? So that's a great question. Um, let me just clarify why we wanted to ban styrofoam. It's not just because it's a plastic container. It is the most toxic type of, of container. It is terrible for the people who have to make the containers. There's lots of, of um, problematic gases that, that come out of that process. It's also on the back end problematic for the environment. It breaks into small, very floaty pieces. So it gets caught in the environment. It gets in the water. Fish eat it mistakenly. It's a very problematic material. And of course, there's no, no way to recycle food-based, food-grade styrofoam. So that's why we, we singled out um, styrofoam in the, it was House Bill 21-1164 is, is the particular piece of legislation. So EcoCycle worked on that bill. And we are also working on, as I mentioned before, the implementation of it. We're working with a number of municipalities and um, with Boulder, with Boulder's PACE program. We're working together to try and create a toolkit that will help restaurants, um, business owners to figure out how to navigate, how to choose better materials. As you mentioned, compostables are no longer the go-to. We're, we're kind of waking up from that. We would love it if every restaurant and food service provider was able to switch to reuse. We recognize that's not gonna happen right away, but we are working towards that. We're working with municipalities again on how to, how to strengthen reuse programs and then how to kind of bridge that gap in between. So is there pushback? There's always pushback, <laughs> no question, but we are doing what we can to help mitigate the, the challenges from that and, and to work with restaurants and municipalities to help get it implemented. Great, thank you. Um, so just, again, in the interest of time, I'm looking at some of the ones that would be harder to answer just via text, um, because we can type up these answers and send them um, the ones that we don't get to in our follow-up email. But I wanted to bring our attention um, just to one of the questions that was also, um, there was some engagement around in the chat, which is from Tanya. While we are pushing for the elimination of plastic and paper bags by imposing fees, food stamps, or by imposing fees, Food stamps do not cover the cost of bags, so how can we do both while ensuring we do not impose extra fees on the poor, something that isn't in just individually based but helps at a larger scale? Um, so yeah, there was just some discussion around like, where does BYO bring your own bag stop since what we're talking about here is an infrastructural um, uh, issue and hypothetically should be an economically um, supportive uh, movement as well. It should be two, two birds, one scone. Um, that's a, a great question. And um, the Colorado, again, it's a, a 21 1164. It does include um, exemptions for people who are using food stamps or, or local or, or state 
uh, food assistance, we know that that is not the ultimate solution. You know, for various reasons, people might maybe aren't quite at that threshold or don't want to bring attention to the fact that they are recipients of that aid. We totally understand that. And at this point, we don't know a better solution. We are definitely working with, like I said before, national groups that are trying to work on this. I was actually on a webinar just last week talking about reuse and equity. Um, and so I, I can say that some of the original reuse models that the companies that were starting, I don't know, four or five years ago, they included, you know, you pay a fee for your reusable mug and then you get that feedback later and you have to have a smartphone to track it. And pretty quickly it became evident that that only worked for people who had the fee to pay up front. That only worked for people who had smartphones that could do that. So those models really have kind of fallen away and those companies are exploring other ways to do the same intent to get more reuse and, and less single use, but to do it in a way that's more accessible to everyone. So. I'd love to say stay tuned and hopefully we'll get there and ideas are welcome and we, we are definitely working on that. Yeah, well said. It's definitely front of mind, front of mission and um, yeah, something that has been ever changing and we would love input on if you have um, more. Um, okay, uh, oh, I also, I saw multiple questions about um, just how the extended producer responsibility, the producer responsibility uh, bill will, um, I guess, interact with this. Let me. Um, I'm, I'm guessing I know where that's going. It's a question we get a lot. Um, producer responsibility bill, the first step in the bill is for the, the producer organization that will hopefully be identified in the next couple of weeks by the state. Um, they will do a needs assessment of the state, what recycling infrastructure we need. And there's a very small piece of that that's gonna be looking at what infrastructure we have and what we need to help deal with compostable packaging. That law is just talking about packaging. So it's not gonna be the be all end all solution for compost by any means. Um, the packaging, there is wording in that law that allows money from those fees to go to composters, but there's nothing in statute yet. So that's one of those many, many pieces that needs to be worked out between now and 2026. So we are definitely paying attention. I can say um, one of the, there's a state board that is advisory to that program. And one of the seats on that board is a composter. Um, so, so there's definitely feedback into that program, but it's, it's mostly focused on recycling and, and won't have a huge impact on compost. Okay. And then someone um, asked, yeah, if that would apply to like produce stickers at all. I can't imagine that producer responsibility would apply to produce stickers, but gosh, that would be awesome. I'm going to have to <laughs> yeah. noodle on that one. <laughs> Someday okay. we'll get to produce stickers. Yeah. Um, if that's our biggest contaminant, we won. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's annoying as heck and we got to get, yeah, I mean, it's, there's no point. We need to get rid of them, but um, right. yeah, not with producer responsibility, unfortunately. <laughs> but that said, producer responsibility was huge. And so a sticker is, yeah, no biggie um, in terms of the, the momentum we've been gaining. Um, Okay, Katie says, what are the roadblocks to introducing a bill that makes businesses use compostable material? And is it possible to also require a business, restaurants, to utilize people's own takeout materials for takeout food, assuming it meets certain standards, et cetera? I'm going to take the second part of that question first. I mentioned the toolkit that we're working with some municipalities on, and that is actually on my bucket list or <laughs> for that project is to work to identify state and local regulations that may be barriers to reuse, um, particularly in dining. So hopefully in the next few months, we will have a, a nice long catalog. And I know there's a national group that's working on that as well um, that I am I'm part of. So hopefully we will have a nice catalog of those and we will have some ideas of approaches on how to, to work on those, whether it's through legislation or just you know, local health codes, that has yet to be seen, but we're definitely working on that piece. 
Dan, I'm going to let you take the first part about a bill that would require businesses to take or use compostable material. Um, yeah, uh, we've talked about it. Um, it is actually a requirement in the state of California. They um, they passed a very comprehensive law um, several years ago. And part of that is that as a municipality, if you are or were you required to, um, as a municipality, to have a collection program? You may be required to actually have uh, developed compost infrastructure. And then the municipality is required to buy back a certain amount of that compost based on a um, population formula. Um, I think, you know, it's, 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 um, I'm, I'm all for that if we can solve contamination. Um, you know, I was in California for um, the uh, National Recycling or Composting Conference back in January, talking to um, uh, folks who represent California municipalities. And they're saying, you know, I don't know what we're gonna do with this contaminated compost. Um, so um, love it, but um, we, have to solve contamination. Cool. Um, what sort of resources are available for individuals who would like to support the local community-based compost infrastructure, so small businesses, entrepreneurs, et cetera, or what suggestions would you have for someone who wants to get started? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What sort of ref sorry, what sort of resources are available for individuals who would like to support the local community-based compost infrastructure and efforts? So small businesses and entrepreneurs as the examples they gave, or what suggestions would you have for someone who wants to get started? I'm not sure if that means a resident that wants to support the businesses or someone who wants to get started as a composter. I, yeah. I, Dan, you looked like you had an answer. Go ahead. <laughs> um, no. um, yeah, I was, I was hopeful that maybe that was saying, um, how do we contribute financially? <laughs> We're looking for donors. Um, that probably wasn't the, wasn't the, the intent of the question. I don't know. Um, maybe that person could clarify. I'm not, I'm not really quite sure. I guess I, I will jump in and say we've said it before, but one of the most important things that we can all do is to help create that market for compost. Because as we drive up the, the value of the finished product, that makes the whole system work better. It, it, it can potentially bring down the cost of the service to compost. Um, I mean, that would, you would have to have a really high demand for compost to do that, but um, that's we do need to to drive that demand. So your flower gardens, your your gar vegetable gardens, if you've got a church or a park or something that, that you have any sort of say in, in using compost there, as well as just participating. If you have the means to um, participate in a, a membership, if you don't already have a local compost um, contract, like through Louisville or Lafayette um, or Golden. Um, so if, there, if there's a way that you can support them that way. I'm not sure if that answers. And if it doesn't, please clarify your question and we will be happy to answer it. Yeah. So that said, um, we shared so many great resources. There were a lot of really thoughtful questions that we answered and a lot of stuff um, from the chat. And so uh, once again, we will um, be sure to capture the chat and the Q&A, um, but to be mindful of everyone's time, I just wanted to say that it's 7.30 and we did answer um, a lot of the questions, 20, it was a lot. Um, and so we 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 typed some, um, our lovely panelists answered some, panelists answered some live. Um, but again, we will be sending you that follow-up email with, um, so you can have the slides and these resources and, um, and the answers to your questions. So, um, once again, thank you all so much for joining us this evening and for being engaged and being part of the solution for this 
um, for this issue, which I, I don't, I, some of you might remember a few years ago when everyone was really panicking about China and we were like, in, in the overall scheme, this is long-term, like really addressing something that had to be addressed and this, um, you know, listening to Rachel and Dan talk, that makes me feel kind of the same, like, yeah, we had this coming and let's really figure it out for real. And not that, anyway, we're moving good places and just seeing all of you showing up, um, as always, uh, fuels our fire. So thank you so much. And thank you really a round of applause virtually for Rachel and Dan for joining us, for Kylie for um, jumping in and, and Marty for supporting and, um, and all of you. So uh, if anyone has anything to add to wrap up, um, I'm just going to ask for a little, little patience. I know Rosie usually sends a wrap up like the day or so after. If you remember the slides earlier, Dan and I are going to be at the Capitol a lot of this week. So it might take us a little longer to, to, to do a, a follow up. But it's because we're engaging actively on this issue. I just, I'm going to jump in. Hi, I'm Marty. Um, I also put in the chat that uh, we've had several questions about backyard composting, and I uh, put a link to Boulder County is offering some uh, trainings on backyard composting coming right up. So take a look in the chat. We can also include that in a follow-up email, um, or you can check it out at uh, bouldercounty.gov. But um, they are uh, those are coming up this weekend, and I believe the weekend after that. Uh, if you want more resources on backyard composting, we also have that information at ecocycle.org.